Okay, so John yesterday went through um, in a whirlwind tour everything that you need to know to analyze functional data, at least the, the theory of it. And so what I'll go through today is the actual practice of functional data analysis inside of the pre-server functional analysis stream. Um, it's going to be more complicated. So if you've already done some fMRI analysis, running um, FSFAST is going to be a little bit more complicated. The basic ideas are still all the same, but because we want to respect the inherent geometry of the, of the brain, we have to make it a little bit more complicated and analyze data on the surface and in the volume. And that has to do with going through uh, atlas spaces. Uh, FSFAST is um, highly automated. And so it relies on having a director structure similar to uh, when you run the anatomical analysis, you know, you run recon all and it creates a subject stir and it creates a subject folder under that and then it creates all these subfolders under that and then under that it creates all of these other files and it, all those files have a certain uh, place and a certain naming convention and that um, naming convention and directory structure allows for highly automated analysis routines and the FSFAS is the same. And so understanding this task requires that you understand some kind of uh, directory structure. And no matter how you're analyzing your fMRI data, you're going to have to have some sort of directory structure. So if you never analyze fMRI data and you're not necessarily planning to use this fast, knowing about this directory structure is something that's important. And then I'll go through the pre-processing. So this is the stuff that John went over yesterday, motion correction, smoothing, stuff like that. Uh, setting up the first level analysis and contrast, as John described, uh, for doing the time series analysis, and then finally um, doing the group analysis and correcting for multiple comparisons. And at that point, it will just simply plug into the stuff that you already learned yesterday from Ender and going through the group analysis tutorial. So if this fast does the time series functional analysis, including event related block design, or the topic does functional connectivity as well, uh, but we're not going to be going through any of that this morning. It's of course built upon pre-surfer and analyzes data on the surface and in the volume, so you will get your subcortical fMRI activation, as well as ROI-based. It can do group analysis. As I mentioned before, it's highly automated. Um, and of course, since it's pre-surfer, you write everything on the command line, there's not really any commands. Um, it mainly relies on, or partially relies on, MATLAB uh, or Octave, which is a free version of MATLAB. And it has a couple of Acne and FSL uh, tools in it as well. So you don't need to know anything about MATLAB or Acne or FSL uh, to run it. Everything is kind of done, done under the hood. <coughs> um, as you might expect, uh, FSFAST respects the inherent geometry of the brain, so smoothing and clustering are done either in the surface for cortex or in the volume for uh, subcortical structures. Uh, this requires, this is where it becomes a little bit more complicated because it requires that analysis be done in these three different spaces. So there's a left hemisphere, there's a right hemisphere, and there's a subcortical space. And so uh, basically you're going to end up doing everything three times, uh, one, one for each space, um, but they can be merged at the end. Um, so it's not a simple volumetric based uh, analysis for all voxels as you would be used to doing if you're used to doing it for analysis. So this is the, the start of the pipeline where you would, you would collect your fMRI data, uh, which would be the 4D uh, time series data. So four dimensions, meaning that you would have one dimension that you know comes out of your ear and another di dimension that comes out of your nose and another dimension that comes out of the top of your head. And those would be the three spatial dimensions, and then the fourth dimension, of course, is time. Uh, this gets motion corrected and slice timing corrected. Um, we then take the, the raw time series data and normalize it and uh, do a B0 correction on it simultaneously. Uh, when we normalize it, we normalize it to uh, FS, uh, FS average. And so that means that we're going to sample it onto the left hemisphere of FS average, the right hemisphere of FS average, and into the subcortical space of FS average. And we'll uh, mask, mask out the non brain regions uh, from each one of those spaces and then perform smoothing uh, in the appropriate space. Um, so, this is, so this gives you three essentially data sets. It takes that, that one 4D uh, data set and breaks it up into three. Uh, data sets, each one of them time series, one on the left hemisphere, one on the right 
this group and wanted to be so portable. And then uh, we take that information and we analyze it in exactly the same way on three, these three parallel tracks. So in the left hemisphere, we'll analyze it with the first level general linear model. So that means that we have to de devise a, a uh, design matrix X and a contrast matrix for the first level. And that same design matrix and contrast matrices are applied to the left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and subcortical analysis. So this assures that you get the same exact analysis regardless of which space that you're in. Uh, the result from the first level GLM, as John described uh, uh, last night, is a set of contrasts. And those contrasts are a re data reduction. So you've take, you taken this time series data and, and you've reduced it basically down to one number, which is your contrast. And then you pass that to the higher level GLM. And at this point, it basically is the same thing as what Ender described, uh, doing the, the general linear model. So you run uh, MRI GLM fit on this. And you do that in each one of the different spaces. And that requires that you come up with a higher level design matrix, which might be uh, a design matrix that you choose, or it might be one that you generate from an FSGD file. And you would have higher level contrast matrices as well that would test um, the overall hypothesis that you want for your entire experiment. And then you would do a correction for multiple comparisons. And then you would combine uh, all of your, your three tables that you have, one, one for each space, into, um, into a single table that you would then uh, go off and put into your publication. So for each space, each space has its own masking. So for the surface, we mask out everything that's in the medial wall. So most of the stuff is, is like white matter and CSF that you're not interested in. But the, the medial wall does cut through some cortical structures. And since we have another way to analyze the subcortical structures, we mask this part of it out so that we don't analyze the same box hole twice. Uh, the next thing is that we have a mask for the subcortical regions. Uh, which is shown here. And what this does is to make sure that we're masking out all of cortex so that voxels that are in in the volume but in cortex are not going to be analyzed in the subcortical mask. So in a typical volume-based analysis, you would analyze all the voxels together. You'd probably smooth in three-dimensional space. And uh, you would get some map that you would get out a single map. Um, that would look something like this. So this is uh, a working memory paradigm. Um, and so you can see functional activation back in the, in the back of the head uh, where you have a visual cortex, um, probably some uh, default mode activity where it's, where it's blue, uh, some motor activity up here. When you run it in FSFAST, what you'd get are three different maps. So, so in your typical volume-based analysis, you would have one map because you analyze every single voxel in, in, the, in the volume. Here you get out three different maps. So you have one map for the subcortical structures. So when you compare this map to the, the one from the, the, the typical volume-based analysis, you see that this map does not have any cortex in it because we've masked that out because we're analyzing cortex um, on the cortical surface itself. So these are three mutually exclusive maps that should not have any voxels that are overlapping between them. Um, however, we can take them and recombine them. So we can take the subcortical left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and then recombine them uh, back into one map. And then that looks uh, something like this, where you look at, the, at this top row here, uh, and compare it to the bottom row, which is the typical volume-based analysis. So here, for example, you see that the, the, the visual activation is uh, tightly bound into, uh, into visual cortex, whereas it's kind of all over the place here in your typical volume-based analysis. So this is done purely for visualization. So when you're done, you can take all of this information and pack it back into a volume, which you might be you might feel more comfortable uh, viewing and maybe makes prettier pictures or something for when you go to to publish it. Um, but it's really only for visualization only. You wouldn't like you know take this map and correct it for multiple. Speaking of multiple comparisons, um, so we have uh, the, the cluster, all the all the typical um, uh, corrections for multiple comparisons are available for do, doing your fMRI analysis, but primarily people are using cluster-based. Uh, and so the idea is that you perform the, um, 
the correction for multiple comparisons uh, separately in each space, so left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and, and subcortical space. And you get a cluster table for uh, each one of them, and then your final table that you would put into your publication would be uh, a, a union of all these individual tables. Okay, so that's, that's basically the overview. And so what I'll go through now is um, all of the gory details that you need to, to be able to run uh, FS fast. Um, so this is a list of nine different steps, and places where you see uh, these green texts there are actual command lines that you would run. So it's only you know, six or seven commands that, that you really need to know. Um, and the first step, of course, is to analyze your your anatomicals and pre server. So it's going to assume that you're basically done with all of your editing and everything like that, and the your anatomical is fixed, and then you start running your, your um, functional command. And so I'll basically go through uh, each one of these things, but this serves as kind of an outline for, for most of the rest of the talk. Uh, so, first thing you have to do is unpack your subject into um, the FSFAST directory structure. And I'll go through that next, but uh, that's done with this command called DCM unpack that takes uh, diagram files and converts them into NIFTs and creates the directory structure. Um, how to link the functional to the anatomical, and that's done with the subject name file. You have to copy paradigm files into run directories, and the paradigm files are the uh, stimulus timing files, and I'll go into detail what those are. Uh, you then configure your analysis, and this is a place also where FSFAST can be different than other software packages, and that you configure an analysis, which means that you collect um, all the parameters that you need to analyze the data and how you want to analyze the data. So the number of uh, conditions, the stimulus schedule, uh, the amount of smoothing you want, um, hemodynamic responses, all that kind of information goes into one place. Uh, and you do that once, and if you have 100 data sets, you do that once, and then you run a second program uh, called SelectSav, um, where it would go off and it would perform the analysis. Uh, the preprocessing is done by preproc dash sesh. So every time you see a dash dash s e s s, that's uh, always a, an FS fast command, and I, I pronounce it dash sesh. Some people say dash seth. Um, but you made it, right? I made it, yeah. If I, <laughs> in hindsight, if I knew that I was going to be here 15 years later, like telling people, dash, sesh, I might have called it something else. <laughs> um, so, so like that, uh, so preprog runs all the preprocessing, motion correction, smoothing, registration. Uh, so like that runs uh, the time series analysis, so it creates a design matrix, contrast matrices, and uh, Fits, fits the design matrix to the time series data. Uh, ISX concat dash slash um, it collects all of that data and stacks it into one file, in which place, at which point you can run a GLM fit. So at that point, you know you basically have collected all of your all of your data. You have all your data reduced down to one number uh, for each subject at every point in space. And at that point, it sort of doesn't really matter that it's fMRI. You know, it could be thickness data, it could be pet data, it could be NEG, it could be DTI. It's just one number per subject, and then it goes into the, um, the group analysis stream. Uh, and then you correct for multiple numbers. So these, these last two steps are things that you've already gone over, but you'll go, go over it again uh, because it won't kill you. Okay, so uh, FSFAST has, is very automated. Um, as much as I could, I and mean, automation requires that you have a certain directory structure associated with it and a certain naming convention. And so this is kind of the overall directory tree that you would have for a project in FSFast. So the top folder I call the project directory. Uh, each folder under that I call the session directory, and the session holds like everything that you would have for a given subject on a given day. So if you had multiple days, if you had longitudinal, each day would have a different session. But mostly you just think of sessions as being subjects. Under that, you have something called a functional subdirectory, which I usually call bold. But if you had, say, multiple paradigms, or if you're doing some task and some rest, then you would put those into different uh, FSDs. Under that, you would have a folder for each run. So uh, run three, five, and six maybe were, uh, were task runs, and then maybe run four was a rest run or something like that. 
And underneath that, you would have the raw data. So the raw data, this is the 4D, uh, the, the time series data, that gets its own uh, folder. And so that's this is the way that everything starts out. And, and um, so you're going to have um, this raw data that's there. And as FSPass runs, it's going to populate uh, that directory and add a whole lot more stuff to it. <coughs> Even though the, the, the raw data looks pretty lonely there all by itself, uh, it's going to have company with it. And uh, these are just some slides that uh, go through and kind of describe uh, in, in more detail what I just went through. So um, I think I'll just uh, slide through these guys. Um, so when you set up the directory structure, there are basically three things that you need to do. You need to pack the raw data into that directory structure. You need to add paradigm files and to create a subject name file. Um, so when you unpack, so the directory structure is a little bit complicated, and if you were able, had to do that by hand every time, um, it would be um, a little tedious. So I wrote this program called DCM Unpack, which is kind of generically useful, not just for running as fast. Um, so you would you would run it, um, DCM Unpack, you give it a dash SRC and path to the, the DICOM folder. So when you collect data, um, and you you say have you know five or six functional runs. You have an anatomical run. Maybe you have a PCR map. Maybe you have some ASL or DTI or something like that. And what you'll get, at least when, from from Siemens, is that everything will be in one folder. And it, a lot of times, the the file names are going to be file names that are this long that look like they're nothing but random numbers. So if you go and look inside of this folder, it just looks like total junk. So what you can do is to run this DCM unpack command and point it to that folder, and it will give you a nice little list of everything that's inside uh, that folder. And then you run it a second time, once you know what's in there, and say, OK, run 3, run 5, and run 6. I'm going to unpack them into uh, the session 1, uh, into a subfolder called bold. I'm going to have them be nifty files, and I'm going to call them f.nai. And this, this command will go through and sort through those um, 800 or 1,000 or 2,000 randomly named files and find all the ones that you want and collect them together and repackage them into a nifty file and create this entire directory structure. So, so it's pretty handy even if you're not going to be using it as fast. Yep. But if it's already in a 4D volume, you're going to have to make the directory yourself. Or can you if, if it, if it's already in a 4D volume, then you would have to make the directory yourself. Yeah. Um, so, that, so that's the first step. So now you have the, the raw data, raw time series data there. Uh, so now you have to let FSFast know what the stimulus schedule is. The stimulus schedule is which stimulus you presented when and for how long. And we do that with something called a par what we call a paradigm file. Um, and this is... Um, just a simple text file, um, and you give, you copy it, possibly a different one into each folder. Um, here I call it i.even.par, and it has this uh, this structure with these five columns that I'll go to in, in, over in, in the next slide. Um, but each one of them just codes the, the stimulus schedule. If it's resting state, what do you do? If it's resting state, what do you do? We have a different, a slightly different pipeline for it. So if you're doing resting state, um, there's obviously no stimulus schedule, so there's nothing to, to copy in there. So you would just skip this particular stuff. Um, so again, every paradigm file might have its own stimulus schedule, and if you're doing, say, like an event-related design or, or whatever, it's surely going to have its own stimulus uh, schedule. Um, and even different subjects can have different stimulus schedules as well. This is totally, this is totally flexible. So what does this paradigm file look like? Um, it has um, these five columns. The first column is the stimulus onset time. The last column is a human readable um, uh, name for each stimulus. Actually, actually, that part is ignored because the, the second column is a unique code for each stimulus. So in this case, I have three stimuli that I'm presenting. One is a fixation, which is always zero. Uh, the second one I call task odd. 
And then the third one is task even. So it's always uh, zero, one, and two, and they have to be um, con contiguous numbers. Um, this fourth column is the duration of the stimulus. Our onset time is always in seconds. Sorry? Our onset time is always in seconds. Yes, onset times are always in seconds. And this third column, which codes the duration of the stimulus, is also always in seconds. And there's no, um, uh, there's no constraint on when stimuli can appear. So if you were to construct your data or do some kind of correction to deal with motion, this would be the place to do it. If you're going to do what? Scrub your data. Scrub my data to do motion correction? Or well, like if I knew the time points where the motion was high, was high all I'd have to do is change the duration for the because I knew we're bad here. It's calling me. Oh, oh, no. So so, uh, so what he's asking about is, is being able to remove or, or account for certain time points that may be corrupted. Um, so this only codes stimulus schedule. So that's the only thing that you do with this stimulus schedule. Um, there'll be, I'll, I'll introduce another technique for, for dealing with you know, bad data points in, in a few minutes. Um, so this, this has nothing, so it doesn't have to be linked to the TR, you know, it can be you know, integer or floating point numbers. Uh, the durations can be anything that don't have to be the same for any. <coughs> All this does is just describe exactly what the stimulus schedule was. Um, because, of course, when you do the fMRI analysis, uh, you know, it's essentially correlational. So you take this raw time series data and you correlate it with some known stimulus schedule. Um, and then this fourth column I have here is all ones, um, but this could be used for parametric modulation analysis. So, for example, if you had some hypothesis that um, that hemodynamic response was linearly related to uh, their reaction time, um, then you could put the reaction time in as a as parametric modulation, and then test whether they test you know exactly that. Okay, so now in the directory structure, um, you have the raw data, and you have the paradigm file, and then the last step before you can run the automated commands is to add this thing called the subject name file. And the subject name file is always called subject name. That's its, that's its name. And inside of that is the name of the anatomical subject uh, that you gave when you ran recon all. So remember, you know, just because, you know, FSFAST and Recon All are all part of FreeServer, it doesn't know, they don't talk to each other necessarily. You know, you'll analyze your anatomical data in one directory structure and you'll analyze your, uh, your functional data in a different directory structure. And you have to be able to tell uh, FreeServer that this functional data belongs with this anatomical. And the way that you link those two together is through this thing called the subject name file. So you put the subject name file directly uh, under the, the session folder, and its contents are the name of the subject. So in this case, like maybe BERT, or you know, good output, or you know, bad output, hopefully not. Um, uh, whatever it is, uh, that the name of the subject that when you ran recon all is what you put inside of the subject name file. And so now, now FSFAST has everything that it basically needs in order to go in and automatically analyze the, the data. Um, almost everything, because it still needs to be able to, uh, to you, you still have to configure the analysis and configure the, the contrast. Okay, so uh, there are a lot of automated commands that you use when you run uh, FSFAST. And so basically, Basically, I, like nobody likes command lines, you know, including me. Like I hate command lines, but they're, I like them better than I like having GUIs and stuff. Uh, so basically, when I write software, I try to make it so that uh, I don't have to type very much at, at the command line. And so I have all these shortcuts in there. Some like nobody will ever know about other than me. <laughs> but I'll tell you a few. One of the jewels that I have, uh, which is this, is what I call a sesh ID file. So again, your session is like your subject, and each subject has a different folder associated with it. And so these session, what I have here is session one, session two, session three, that's just a, an arbitrary name you would 
give to your to your subject. It doesn't have to be SES, S01, SES02. Um, you can have anything. Uh, and of course, you might have 20 subjects in your analysis. You might have 300. Like I have one data set where I have 350 subjects in my fMRI analysis, big study. Um, and so I don't like you know typing out 350 command lines. So what I did. This, what I call a SESH ID file, in which you list all of your subjects. So this is just a text file that has a list of all the subjects that you want to analyze. Um, and then when you run commands in FSFast, you can give it a dash SF and list this SESH ID. And then it's going to go off and do that command however many times you have subjects. Uh, so with that one command, you can go off and pre-process every single, you know, for 350 sets. You can do time series analysis of every 350 data sets. So it's pretty convenient. It takes a lot of the, the pain away from having to use a command line. Okay. So now you're ready to start um, with some, some of the, the, the first series commands, uh, first level analysis. Um, okay. First level analysis is, uh, is time series analysis. And it processes everything inside of this uh, functional subter. So everything inside of the bold folder is going to be analyzed. So it's going to do pre-processing, motion correction, smoothing, et cetera, and uh, general linear model uh, time series analysis. So the pre-processing, um, it actually does a lot, including all of the stuff that John mentioned yesterday. So I'll just go through them uh, quickly here. It's going to create a registration template, which is going to be uh, everything that's going to, the, the registration template is what serves as um, the, the registration model for each run. So each run is going to have 100 time points, 200 time points. And uh, so you need to choose one of those to say, okay, I want everything registered to this time point. And so what we do is we choose the middle time point uh, every run uh, as that registration template. So everything's going to be motion corrected to that template. And then we're going to register that template to the higher level, um, or to the to the anatomical. And so this is going to this idea of a, of a registration template is going to reappear during the multimodal talk that Lola is going to give this afternoon. So if you're interested in, in applying free surfer, the anatomical analysis, and you don't want to use MS Fast, or you have some other like a PET or or ASL or something like that um, that you want to analyze then uh, this registration template is going to become very important uh, because that's how you're going to link the anatomical analysis to your cross-modal analysis. Okay, so it does uh, motion correction to that template. Uh, it will do slice timing correction if you are using it. It will um, register the anatomical to the functional. It will create these masks that I described, so the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere, and some cortical mask. Uh, we will perform a global intensity normalization, which is just a, a rescaling. And it will resample the raw time series to uh, the MNI305, which we use for the subcortical volume analysis, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And if you're doing B0 distortion correction, that's where that will happen as well. Then finally, after all of that, it performs spatial smoothing. Um, so, uh, so again, you, know, you start off with this 40 time series data set and then it breaks it up into three time series data sets. And the command that you run is something called uh, preproc-sesh. Uh, you get it at SF, and this is the sesh ID file that has a list of all the subjects that you want to analyze. And you tell it that you want, want it to sample it onto the surface of FS average. So this is the normalization. Uh, this tells it to do the normalization. And LHRH says to do it onto the left hemisphere of FS average and onto the right hemisphere of FS average. If you want it to do the volume based analysis, you give it dash MNI 305. Uh, so it will do it in the subcortical space. And then uh, here I just told it to smooth it by 5 millimeters full with half X. And per run says to do it on, uh, on a run wise basis, uh, motion correction and registration on a run wise basis, which is what we almost always do. Um, a couple of things to note here. You could break this up. Let's say that you wanted to do uh, volume-based analysis where you smoothed by 5 millimeters, but you wanted 10 millimeters 
when you smoothed on the surface, because you, you can smooth more on the surface than you can in the volume. Uh, in that case, I would run this command uh, two different times. Uh, in one case, I would remove this dash MNI305 and only list uh, the FS average LHRH, and then I would change the smoothing level to 10. In the other instance, I would remove uh, this um, indication of surface, and I would uh, leave the, the full and half maximum of 5. If I'm doing slice timing correction, I would um, include uh, an option there. Uh, and to get more options and find out exactly what it's doing, you can run preproc dash uh, sesh with uh, dash help. So this is going to go off and it's going to do all of that stuff. And if you have a lot of subjects, this can, can take uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, I should point out here uh, that if you had, say, 300 subjects and you didn't, and you wanted to run them all in parallel, you could uh, create uh, different session ID files with, say, you know, 50 sessions in each one of them, and then run this command um, uh, seven different times, you know, 350 sessions. And so you could launch, we could, you could launch all seven of them simultaneously. So when you're done, this is what the directory structure looks like. You have your project folder where you run all of these commands from. Uh, you have the session folder where your subjects data is. This is a functional subdirectory. Uh, this is each run. And then here we have our f.nii, which is our raw time series data, and odd.even.par, which is our paradigm file. And then all of this other stuff is added uh, by this preprocessing command. And the most important things are these three different files that are in green. So one is the left hemisphere, one is the right hemisphere, and the other is the volume-based analysis. Um, so, uh, so now you have your data all pre-processed and nice and clean and everything, and you're ready to start doing the first level general linear model. And as you probably learned yesterday from John, like doing doing fMRI analysis is not like doing anatomical analysis. You know, it's considerably more complicated, and there are a lot of more bells and whistles and lots of more decisions that you have to make. The design is much more complicated. The analysis is much more complicated. Um, so there are lots of decisions uh, that you have to make, even prior to, to collecting data. And then you have to make decisions about how you're going to take that data and collapse it down into that one number that you're then going to pass up to the next higher level. And this isn't the case for, say, a thickness study, because you analyze your data and you get thickness, and that thickness is that one number. And so there are not many decisions that you have to, to make about how to create that one number. But in fMRI, it's a, it's a very different story. Uh, so you have to specify a whole lot of information uh, on when you go to analyze your data, such as um, you specify uh, the model that you want, so it's either an, an event-related or block design. And from an analysis standpoint, event-related and blocked are exactly the same thing. Uh, we also have the um, opportunity to analyze something called an AD blocked, which is just a periodic you know, on off, say, or two condition uh, task. Uh, we have retina topy that's used for studying uh, the visual cortex and the different uh, the stages of the visual processing. Um, you have to specify the, the task timing within this paradigm file. Uh, you have to specify the hemodynamic response that you want to use. And then after all of that, you still have to specify what the contrasts are that you want to, to test your hypotheses. Um, in addition, um, it, there could be functional connectivity as well. And that's just describing kind of the signal of interest. But there are lots of signals that you're not interested in in, in fMRI, unfortunately. Uh, and so you have to specify how you want to handle those things as well. So there are low-frequency drifts. You can do this time point of exclusion file. Um, you can include motion correction regressors um, as regressors of no interest. Um, or if you're measuring physiology, heart rate, respiration, that kind of thing, uh, then you can include those as regressors of no interest as well. Um, and then on top of that, we have something called temporal white, which is, which is done automatically. So this is an example that John went over yesterday. Uh, this is um, a, a flashing checkerboard and um, auditory tone and finger tapping. And it's on off, uh, 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off. And so what I did was, for um, demonstration purposes, I just divided this up into 
uh, task on and task even. So we end up with three conditions. We have a, a fixation point for, for 15 seconds, uh, we have the even blocks, and we have the odd blocks. And so we would set this up into a general linear model uh, where, uh, again, um, this thing on the left is the raw time series data at a single voxel, and we'll just do the same thing for every single voxel. And I said that this is a weighted combination of different effects, the effect of the, uh, the odd block, the effect of the even block, and the effect of the baseline. So what I'm saying is that this raw time series, uh, everything in there can be modeled by these three different effects, and, um, and each effect has a particular weight. And, uh, and it's, the it's the job of the analysis that given this raw time series and given this design matrix, it computes what these betas are. And those betas mean something. So the idea here is that the beta odd is the hemodynamic response amplitude to the odd block. The beta even is the hemodynamic response uh, amplitude to the even block. And so hopefully these amplitudes are related to the amount of neural firing. So those betas are important and they mean something and it's uh, with respect to these betas that you make and test hypotheses. Um, so as I said before, when you configure, uh, when, you, when you run FSFAS, and it's basically done in these, in these two different stages where you configure your first level analysis, uh, where you it create a collection of parameters and you create contrasts, which describe how to create the contrast from the parameters, and then you perform the analysis. So, um, for example, in like SPM, when you analyze fMRI data, um, probably most of you are using uh, the, the GUI where you would be required to go in and, and enter all of this information in for, for one run, and then you would analyze that run. And then you would analyze maybe the next day a, a different subject, and you would have to enter all that information in again. And if you had to do that 300 times, that's just a recipe for um, making a mistake and analyzing some subjects in one way and some subjects in another way. Uh, this is designed to prevent that so that you only create these analysis parameters once. And then you, when you analyze data, you just say, use these parameters. So this way you're not entering uh, the same parameters over and over and over again. But it does make things a little bit uh, less intuitive because you're just configuring on one step and then analyzing uh, another step. Okay, so this uh, bad boy is called MK analysis dash session. That's this is what's going to configure the first level GLM. And so you would run this from the from the project directory. And when you run it, what it's going to do is it's going to create a new folder. And that folder is going to be called the analysis folder. In this case, I call the analysis um, odd even dot sm5 dot lh. And this is going to be the analysis folder for the left hemisphere uh, FS average smoothed by five millimeters. So the name is arbitrary. You just have, need to have a name that is, is descriptive. And it's going to create this file called analysis.info, which is just this uh, text file that's going to have all the parameters that are entered into this uh, into this command line. So what I'll do is just go through the different uh, the different parameters and try to relate them to you. Because what you're going to have to do is make a, a um, when you start with your design, you're going to have to choose what these parameters are. And some of them are fairly stereotyped, but other ones you'll have to they are going to be unique to your own design. Uh, so the first one is to specify uh, what pre-processing options you want. So uh, we've already pre-processed the data. Uh, which is fine, so I just needed to tell it where to find the, the pre-processed data. So for this analysis, I'm going to tell it that I want to analyze the data on FS average, left hemisphere of FS average that's been smoothed by five millimeters. And once it has this information, it can go into this directory structure and it can find the right uh, pre-processed time series uh, data file here. And remember, we have to do this for left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and for the MNI 305. So when I do this for the MNI 305, for example, I would give it a different analysis name. And inside of the project, I would then have two analysis folders. And, um, and in this one, I would say, in this command line, I would say to, to use the MNI 305 
and that, that's been spoofed by, by five millimeters. And then it can go in and it can find, when we actually go to analyze the data, um, the raw data, uh, that's or the, the time series data that's been pre-processed for the you know, MNI between five. So moving on with the, with the command, um, I give it a dash paradigm, and I tell it odd even dot par, and so that tells it to when it's when it goes to analyze the data to work its way down through the tree and find something called odd even dot par, and that's where it's going to get the stimulus schedule from. I tell it that's that it's event related as opposed to AV block to written copy or functional connectivity. I tell it to use a particular hemodynamic response function. So in FSFAST, we have three different um, functions that are possible. So one is this, the SPM hemodynamic response function, which is this blue one. Uh, then I have uh, one that FSL uses, and then I have one that uh, I created about 15 years ago um, called FSFAST. Um, and I usually use, just use the SPM hemodynamic response function. Um, in the end, uh, depending upon what your design is, it may or may not make any difference at all. If you have, so, so the, the longer your events are, uh, the less of a difference it makes. So if you have a 15 second event, then it makes almost no difference what your, which hemodynamic response function you end up choosing. If you have something that's really short, if you're doing an event-related design where it's two seconds, then it can make more of a difference. Uh, but even then, like I've, I've done, I've, I've done a lot of analyses, like you know, trying to find differences in these things, and haven't been able to find much. So I generally don't agonize too much over my choice of the dynamic response function and just use the uh, the SPM dynamic. So this is the the, the canonical one that comes with uh, with SPM. I just have. I found out what the parameters were, just was able to improve that function. Um, if you want to add derivatives onto that, which uh, some people do, uh, you can tell it how many derivatives you want. Here I say zero, so there are no derivatives. It's just using the, the main component of it. Uh, the ref event juror uh, stands for the reference event duration. And th this is another one that I, that I almost regret including in the command line instead of just setting it myself because uh, it's so difficult to explain. So this has this will have absolutely no effect on p-values or like p-values of your clusters or anything like that. This is just <coughs> something that's used for scaling so that if you were to report uh, values of like the percent signal change, these would be this would be a meaningful number, which is surprisingly difficult to actually get out. Um, and the only thing I'd, I'll tell you here is that you simply just set it to the duration of the stimulus in your paradigm file. So if your stimulus is a 15 second block, it's just 15 seconds. If your stimulus is a two second event related paradigm, then just set it to two seconds. And if you have different numbers uh, or your different stimuli have different durations, then just set it to the average one. When you want to look at the effect size for a task regressor that's varying, and you just does the ref of discarded, or if, if, if it's a, a task regressor that's what? It's varying continuously. Varying so, so continuously. So no preferred duration for a task regressor. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess you could do that as like a parametric modulation, I guess. Um, but can you give me an example of? Uh, well, uh, sure. So if you were to, uh, to uh, be tracking a uh, reaction time. Uh, and uh, areas that were correlated with shorter versus longer. Okay, so, so a reaction time would just be a straightforward parametric modulation. Okay. And, and so ref event duration would, would be discarded for this? It would be uh, the scale. I would just set it to the, um, to still the duration of whatever your stimulus is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, again, it, this is not something to really agonize over. So this would just be, uh, and, if, and if you don't, if you never report percent signal change, then you could set this thing to anything but zero. Don't set it to zero. You can set it to anything but zero, and it's not going to make any difference to your uh, to, to your analysis. Uh, Polyfit two uh, is a way to include or 
remove some low frequency drips. Um, so second order polynomial is in default, but sometimes I go up to six or 10 or something like that. Um, there's, there's a way that you can compute uh, an actual uh, frequency to, to um, so this is basically like a, a, a high pass filter. And so there's a way that you can compute the, the frequency uh, of high pass filter given the number of um, uh, polynomial drip terms. But I usually use two or three or four or something like that. Um, and then there's also, there's some other option. There's a, there's a dash a HPF, and you can actually give it a cutoff. And this uses a discrete cosine transform, the same as, as what uh, SPM uses. Uh, but this can be a little aggressive, and so I, don't, I often don't like to use it. Uh, dash MC EXT wrench says to use the motion correction regressors as, uh, or motion correction parameters as regressors of non interest. So when, when John was talking yesterday about uh, doing motion correction, he, he created, he, he showed these motion correction plots where you had three translations and you had three rotations um, at every time point. Could I ask something about the code Yep. First order time modulation. First order so time modulation. modulation uh, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that option. Yeah. So, um, so as John mentioned, you know, when you do motion correction, what what it does is it tries to estimate these six motion correction parameters at every time point. So there are basically three ways that you can. Uh, translate your head. You, know, you can translate it you know, forward and backwards like this. Like this. And go, go up and down like, like that. And there are three ways that you can rotate your head. You can ro you know, nod your head yes, and shake your head no. You know, maybe. So those are the six ways that you can move your head. And the motion correction will report those six numbers for every time point that you have. And so what a lot of people like to do is just take so those six numbers and throw them in as, uh, as nuisance regressors. Um, and even though I have it listed here, um, I'm not a big fan of, of this um, because it can just do unpredictable things. You know, if, you're, if you have a little bit of motion that just happens to be stimulus correlated, uh, then it's going to create all these collinearities in your design matrix and then funny thing, really funny things will happen. So I've seen it on a very few occasions actually help out quite a bit, but most of the time it kind of doesn't do much because motion is just something that's very, very complicated. So you just leave that flag off? So I would, I just leave that flag off. For um, for resting state data, I usually include it though. So I don't usually, Usually I just include all of my data. Um, I've done a lot of studies where like I, I try to like exclude based on some criteria and like you know, or I look at high movers versus low movers or something like that. And for task based data, I can't really find much of a difference. And I think most of the time if you're really if you're if you're powered well enough, then it's probably not going to make that much of a difference. Um, for resting state data, it can be a very different story. I don't, I haven't analyzed tons of resting state data, but uh, motion can be quite a confound for resting state data as well. Um, let's see. Uh, in skip four tells it to remove the first four time points. So it does this in a way that you don't have to change your paradigm file. So. Um, you always just have the same paradigm file, uh, and that paradigm file time equals zero has to do with uh, the acquisition of the first stored image in, in the file. And so this removes the first four, but you don't have to go back and change any of the, of the timing in, in the paradigm file. Um, and the reason that I do this is because you have um, some, um, it takes a while for the, uh, the 
bold series to equilibrate. And so usually you'll have two time points that are automatically discarded. And generally that's not enough. At a TR2 <coughs> and a 3T, I like to remove the first six uh, time points. So that's why I have four here. Um, so I would recommend removing at least the first six time points. If your TR is much less than, than two, then you probably have to remove more. Um, also, I want to take the opportunity here to point out that you can uh, create uh, something called a time point exclude file. And this is getting to the question that was asked earlier. Like if you just had, if you looked at your at your at your say motion correction, and the person was very very still, except for one time point where they had like a big head bob, and you just wanted to remove that one time point or the uh, several time points around it, then you can create this thing called this TP exclude file in which you put the time in seconds of the time points that you want to remove and then um, and put that into the, into the folder uh, along with where your, your raw time series is. Uh, then FSFast will go in there and kind of surgically remove those uh, particular time points. So there's nothing that you don't have to go in there and cut it out yourself. Uh, maybe I missed this, but where do you, how do you identify the TRs that were eliminated in the <coughs> And how do you identify TRs that you would want to remove? Or, yeah, or how do I, uh, you know, what was produced to identify the TRs? Um, there is, um, there's a motion correction file, so what most people would do would be to look at the, the plot, the motion correction plots. And, uh, and we have software to, to actually bring up plots. Um, uh, or you can just bring it up in MATLAB or something like that. But you could look through there. Um, at one point, I wrote something that would try to detect spikes, um, but that was like 10 years ago when spikes were a problem, and now it never seems like it's getting <coughs> spiky all the much anymore. Um, so, but you, in theory, you could look at like the mean time force or something like that. So. Is there any way to like, you know, say you're doing a block design, you could do the TR, you know, the TR before and the TR after? TR before what? Before the, the spike. Oh, if there was a spike, if there was just a, a like a scanner spike, I would just remove the. I would I would tell FSFast to exclude a particular time point, and you wouldn't need to go either side. If there's actual motion, then you probably need to exclude like three or four time points. After that. Um, the time points here are they the first four volumes or TR? Those are second. Uh, the first four volumes. So the end skip here tells it to remove the first four volumes, which are the first four TRs. So how is that really different from um, adding the innocent use in regards to Adding what in? The, the exclusions? To the yeah, exclusion, the time points. So, that, so that's exactly the way that, that FSFAS works, is that it, it includes anything that you want to exclude. Okay. As as just another nuisance repressor. So this is, this is a standard thing here. You would do that. Yeah, you could actually. You would not. You don't actually have to do that. If you wanted to, you could include these uh, these four points in your time point exclude file. There, there's some redundancy there. Okay, moving on. Uh, then you tell it what the TR is and the number of non-null conditions that you have. Uh, so. In theory, this information is uh, is redundant because the TR is saved in the raw data, and the number of conditions is in your paradigm file. But this gives FSFast some redundancy, so it can say, "Okay, you think the TR is two, but in reality, the TR was 2.2," and so it will stop and say, "You know, fix fix this problem because something went wrong." And so this just is a way to prevent you from. Uh, from analyzing data in a, in a way that you that you're not actually um, uh, not actually intended. So if like on one day the operator accidentally collected data at you know 2.2 second TR instead of two uh, TR two, then uh, this will flag that and say you know I don't know what to do. You have to do something different. Um, so now. So, so that configures the, uh, the analysis. And, and basically what that means is that it, you've given FSFAST everything that it needs now to go off and create a design matrix. 
And basically, it's going to create a, a regressor for each event type. It's going to create regressors for nuisance variables, you know, motion correction, um, exclude, template exclude files, um, all, all of these things. Um, and, but then you still need to tell it what contrasts they were interested in. And if you remember from yesterday, all these contrasts are ways, are, are, are mechanisms to embody the hypothesis that you want to test. And so this is the, the second thing that people often have problems with when they're doing fMRI analysis or, or really any analysis, being able to translate the hypothesis that they want to test into uh, a contrast. And so we try to make that a little bit easier in FSFAS. But the basic idea is that you have these uh, regression coefficients. You have a regression coefficient for each regressor, uh, nuisance or, or otherwise. And you have to take them and reduce all of those betas down into one number. And then we test that number against whether that number is statistically different from zero or not. And so um, in this case, if I wanted to test like the odd versus the even, then I would have um, I would have beta odd minus beta even, which means that the weight I would create this weighted sum of my beta. So my weight here <coughs> for beta odd would be uh, plus one, and my weight for beta even would be minus one. And this would give me a contrast of plus one and minus one. And uh, when you configure contrast in FSFAST, you do it with this uh, mk contrast such command. And I give it the analysis that I want to make the contrast for. Um, and then I give the contrast a name. This is going to be the name that's going to follow this contrast all along. So this is a, rather than just having to know that, you know, okay, plus one, minus one is odd versus even, I can actually give it a name. And then I give it this dash A1 and this dash C2. And I'll talk about what that means in, in a second. Um, so when you run this command, it's going to go into the analysis folder. It's going to find the analysis.info file. And then it's going to create this file called odd versus even.mat, which is the name of the contrast that, that's given here. Um, and then I give it these dash A and dash C options. And those are going to indicate which conditions are active conditions and which conditions are control conditions. So by giving it a dash A, I say, that it's an active condition, and it's going to get a plus one in the <coughs> contrast matrix. If I get a, give it a dash C, that means it's a control condition, and it's going to get a minus one in the, in the uh, contrast matrix. And so this one and two are derived from the paradigm file. So in this case, one uh, they ended up coding for task odd, and two ended up coding for task even. So what I get is, um, condition one minus condition two, which is task odd minus task even, which is why I call this odd versus even. Um, an exception to this is if I have, uh, if I specify a condition to be zero, um, in which case uh, it says to um, to compute a contrast with respect to fixation. Um, and so in this case, I said, you know, I, I want to test the hypothesis that the response to the odd block was significantly different than uh, fixation. So, you know, that there's a deviation from baseline. So I give it dash A1, uh, where 1 is the task odd, and versus 0, which is the fixation. So in this case, my contrast matrix is going to be 1, 0. So the 1 is the is the first column of my design matrix that is the, the task odd, and two is going to be um, uh, task even. In this, in this contrast, I'm not interested in task even, so I give it a zero in the contrast matrix, indicating that it's effectively, at least for this contrast, a, um, a, a nuisance variable. So this is a more complicated example of what if you have three conditions. And in, in, when you do the tutorial, you'll have uh, five conditions, which is not unreasonable. I mean, it's, a, it's a little bit much, but it's not unreasonable for an fMRI design to have five conditions. So I just have two little examples here to show, like what if I were presenting faces that were happy, sad, and bad. And I had a hypothesis that the response to happy is different than response to mad. 
so in this case, I'm not saying anything about sad. Maybe sad is just in there because I need it for the psychology of the experiment. Uh, so I create a, a, a contrast, and I would give it dash A1, saying that my active condition is happy, and dash C3, saying that my control condition is bad. And so that would set my contrast matrix equal to 1, 0, minus 1. So the 0 here is for the sad, and I don't have a statement about sad in my hypothesis, so that gets set to 0. So I end up with plus 1 for the happy and minus 1 for the sad. Uh, what if I wanted to know whether the response to happy is different than the average response to sad and mad? So think of sad and mad as kind of like a negative affect and happy as a positive affect. And I just want to know whether there's a difference between the, the negative and positive. I would say um, dash A1, which says to set happy to be the active condition. And dash C2 and dash C3, which would be to say set sad and mad to control conditions. Uh, in the actual contrast matrix that it creates, it sees uh, that it has two control conditions, and so it automatically averages those two by multiplying them by 0.5 and, and, and together. So you can have any number of these things. You can have any number of uh, conditions. If you have five conditions, you might only test one or two of them. Uh, you can combine, can combine conditions together to create averages. Okay, so to summarize this, uh, the configuration, uh, you run MK analysis dash dash, and you run MK contrast dash dash, um, and you need to make a configuration for both the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere, and MNI 305. You specify what preprocessing options you want, what nuisance regressors you want, how you want to handle the noise, and what all the contrasts are. And this configuration, as I mentioned before, does not actually do any analysis. In fact, you could before you ever collect any data, you can sit down at your computer and start creating uh, these analyses and contrasts. Um, it's going to create a folder uh, for each analysis in the project uh, folder. Um, so you do this once, and then uh, each one of them should only take a few seconds to run. Uh, and then in the next stage, you actually go and apply these to the different data sets. But at this point, at this point, the hard work is done. You know, until you get up to the group analysis. Um, so to do the first level general linear model, uh, you run this program called SELECTSAP3-SESH. You give it the list of sub, uh, subjects that you want to analyze. Um, and then you give the name of the analysis. And so once it has this, now it can go off and do everything. So it can find the raw data because it knows where the session is and it knows like, uh, to go down into the bold directory and it can find all the runs and it knows what the raw data is called, and it knows what the paradigm file is called, um, and it, and it uh, can, from the paradigm file and all the information that you gave it, it can construct the design matrix, and from the design matrix and the raw data, it fits the, the data to the, to the design matrix and computes the betas, the regression coefficients. And from the contrast matrix, it can compute the contrast. Um, it uh, takes all the, 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 the first level analyses, all, of, all the first level runs, so if you have five runs in your fMRI anal um, acquisition, it will combine them all <coughs> together. Something called, I call a smart calculation, which is basically a, a fix and fix model. So this is what John was describing yesterday, of combining uh, first level analyses in a, in a fix and fix model, and then you use mixed or random effects at the higher level. Um, so it does all of the sessions, so this could take a while, if you know if you have a hundred of them. Um, it will not run, rerun anything if, if something is up to date. So what it does is it goes in and it looks at the timestamps of all the different files. And it says, you know, okay, no, nothing has changed since the last time that you ran this. So it will say, um, okay, I don't need to run this particular session again. So this way you can just give it all the sessions that you have and it figures out what needs to be analyzed. And if something changes, it'll only reanalyze um, what needs to be uh, reanalyzed. So this is, this, is pretty, um, uh, this is pretty handy, especially if you have big data sets and you, don't, you can't quite remember what you've analyzed and what you haven't analyzed. All you have to do is type cell exact three and we'll figure everything out. So the first time that you run it, you know, it might take uh, hours and hours to run. Uh, probably it takes um, you know, 10, 15 
minutes if you only have a couple of runs or maybe it takes an hour, you know, a bunch of runs per, per subject. Um, but then after all of that's done, if you were to rerun it again, it would just return immediately saying everything's already done and I don't have to change anything. Uh, this step does require either MATLAB or Octave. Octave is the even free version of MATLAB. Okay, so... Uh, require means just install it and then MATLAB will take care. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just need, yeah, you just need to install MATLAB and have it in your account. Anything else? MATLAB and then like there are several... Like, uh, it it runs around. a couple of yeah. FSL and AFP commands, but uh, but it's only like one FSL command and one AFP command, and we actually got permission to distribute those commands with preserver, so you don't have to have FSL or AFP installed. No, the question is, uh, is there a particular toolbox? Oh, to a particular toolbox in MATLAB, no. It's just a particular toolbox. Yeah. I mean, it does, the way I did was I rewrote a lot of functions in, in MATLAB that would have required a toolbox, so I wanted to avoid having to have toolboxes. Okay, so, you know, the, at, at this point, the, the hard work of the first level analysis is done. So you can tell that it's a lot more complicated than just running recon all and getting the thickness number up. But at this point, you have uh, your, your one number that you want to bring up to the next higher level. Um, so if you, were to, if you were to look inside of your project folder, you would see you know, that you would have a, you're inside of a session uh, you know, for a given subject, you have a, a, a run old folder. Underneath that, you would have an analysis folder, underneath that you would have a contrast folder, and underneath that you would have these three files here. Uh, the CES.NII is the, the effect size, so that's basically the percent signal change of the contrast. You have the CES var, which is the variance, and if you were to take the ratio of those two, you would get a T value out of it, and from that you can compare the same. So we have these three uh, maps that are available uh, at, at the first level analysis. Um, yep. What degree of freedom does it use for that T and SIG on the individual subjects? What, what degree of freedom does it use for that T and SIG? It's the total number of time points across all runs minus the number of uh, regressors that you have. So that's going to be you know, on the order of several hundred. A lot. A lot. Um, so I forgot. To change these slides, but um, when when you uh, so at this point, before going on to the higher level, you can actually look at your individual subject uh, data set. You can do this with this uh, tk surfer dash sesh command or tk meta dash sesh. So tk surfer and tk meta are um, visualization tools that are a little bit older. We have something new called Freeview, which you've been working with. And when you run these commands, they're actually going to call Freeview, they won't call TKMeta and TK Server. Um, but this allows you, these, these commands, um, you, you've probably noticed that the, the Freeview command lines can be you know, that long. Uh, this allows you to, to just type you know, um, shorter commands and it'll go off and find all the things and create a, a preview command line for you. So like I said, I don't like typing anymore. Um, so here I say TK Surfer, I give it the session that I want to see, I give it the analysis, I give it the contrast. Um, I can actually give it uh, multiple contrasts if I want to. Uh, and the same thing for, for TK Medit. And when I bring it up, it's gonna look something like this. Where you, at, at this point, it's on the FS average brain, uh, but this is an individual. And then you see some positive activation, you see some negative activation, and then it's up to you to start interpreting uh, what all these different things might be. But again, you'll see it on the left hemisphere, on the right hemisphere, and uh, for some political structures. And again, you're not going to see any functional activation in, in the cortex for the volume-based analysis because that's all been passed out. Okay, so, so now you're done with your first level anal analysis, and this is basically what the FSFAST uh, directory tree looks like. So you have your project folder, you have a bunch of sessions underneath, and they all basically look the same. You have a bold folder, you have a, an analysis folder, under the analysis folder you have a contrast, and then under that you have the CES and CES bar files. 
And these are the things, two things that are going to be passed up to the next higher level. Um, so in our, in our uh, block diagram here, uh, we're, we've, we're done with this first level analysis where um, Epispass created design matrix and created contrast matrices. And we're ready to move up to the next higher level. And at this point, it's going to start to look very similar to uh, what uh, Andrew presented yesterday. Um, so in the anatomical stream, prior to running uh, GLM fit, what you would do is you would run um, MRIS preproc. And that would go through and it would, uh, it would sample all of the data, the, like the thickness data, from the individual surface to FS average. And it would stack it all together and it would maybe smooth it as well. And then you would be ready to run MRI GLM fit. And so there's, a, there's this command called ISX concat dash sesh, which basically does the same thing. So you tell it which analysis you're working for, working with, and uh, the contrast that you want. You give it the, uh, the SESH ID file that you want, and you give it an output folder. And so what this is going to do is it's going to create the output folder, and under that, it's going to create another uh, analysis folder. Under that, it's going to create another contrast folder. And then what it does is it goes through uh, each one of these different sessions and simply takes all the, the contrast files and concatenates them together into the CES file. And it takes all the variance files and concatenates them together into this one file. So th this, these two files here are just a stack of the fMRI contrast across all of your subjects. Um, and this, the Sesh ID file here is important because the order of the subjects you're going to have in that stack is going to be the same as with the lit, as the order that you have in this list of uh, sessions. And so, uh, when you actually go to do a group analysis, remember uh, you're you're creating an FSGD file, which is going to create um, a design matrix at the higher level. And each row in that design matrix is going to be a subject. And so, if the order of the rows in your design matrix does not match the order of the subjects and your input, then you're going to have two things that are mismatching and it's just going to turn out to be uh, garbage. Um, so at this point, you're ready to run MRI GLM fit, and it's mostly the same thing as what Ender described with a couple of extra twists. So as, as, as John described yesterday, there are three ways to do a higher level uh, GLM analysis in, with, um, uh, with fMRI. And the reason for that is that you actually have information about how valuable <coughs> each subject is. So when you do an anatomical analysis and you get a thickness measure out, you only get that one number, and there's you know, like it's the thickness at this particular point in the brain is you know 2.75, and you don't have any idea for how much variance there is with that number. So your only option at that point is to do a random effects analysis where you just pretend like that number and it doesn't have any noise in it. Uh, but that number has noise in it, and these fMRI numbers have noise in it. And, but the difference is, is that I have some estimate of how noisy that fMRI is because I've collected hundreds of time points on this particular subject. So I have an idea of how noisy that is, and that information can be incorporated into uh, this higher level analysis. Okay, so. Um, so you would run MRI GLM fit as you would for the anatomical analysis uh, after CDing where these files are. And so what I'll do is I'll just step through some of these commands which you've, which you've already seen already, but um, we'll kill you to see it, see it again. And there are a couple of extra twists that are unique for MRI. Um, so first I tell it that this is a surface-based analysis, uh, and I tell it that the surface is FS average and that uh, it's going to be on the left hemisphere of FS average. And remember, I'm going to have to do this three times, uh, one for the right hemisphere and one for the MNI-305. I tell it the input is CES.NII. And when you're in the anatomical stream, uh, this would be the stack of thicknesses. In this case, this is the stack of contrast values. And this is where the twist comes in, where I give it a dash uh, WLS, which stands for weighted base squares, and I tell it, uh, I pass it the, the variance. So this is the stack of variances. 
And so this tells us how much noise, how, how noisy each subject is, and then can incorporate that into the analysis. And everything else is basically going to be the same. So here's this uh, FSGD file where you've listed all of your subjects um, and demographic information, the information that you want to use um, in your in your design matrix. Um, and just to point out again that the order of the subjects in this FSGD file has to be the same as the order of the subjects in your uh, in your sesh ID file when you ran ISX concat dash sesh. Will it throw an error, or will it likely run with mismatched things? And it, it, it will it in? will not throw an error because it won't know. I, and if you have a different number in there, uh, then it, then it will throw an error. But otherwise. It's like you know, it has no way. It has no way to know unless unless you tell it. Yeah, things are telling you like something. Yeah, else. it's actually possible to pass the FSGD file to ISX concat dash sesh, in which case it'll have the sesh ID file <coughs> and the FSGD, and then at that point it can um, it can it can see that that it's different. Um, so again, you have to create. Uh, your higher level uh, design matrices. And uh, this is, again, identical to what you would do in the anatomical stream, but I just want to make, I just want to emphasize the fact uh, that you have these two different levels of analysis. So it's like a hierarchical general linear model. Where at the lower level, you have a design matrix which models temporal effects and you have contrast matrices which you use to uh, test hypotheses at the first level. At the higher level, you have, uh, instead of time series, you have demographic effects of you know, age and IQ and diagnosis and gender and handedness and stuff like that. And you have contrasts that are then going to do something a little bit possibly different. Because at the higher level, you're actually um, bringing in contrasts from the lower level. And so, um, it becomes a little bit more complicated to think about. Let's say that you had um, normals and schizophrenics, and in, in your fMRI you're looking at happy faces versus sad faces, and you wanted to test for an interaction between schizophrenics and normals. And normally, like if you're you know if you're forgetting fMRI for a moment, but to test for an interaction, uh, that interaction you would have four items in your contrast matrix, which would be like a, a plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. And that would test for the interaction between um, emotional valence and diagnosis. Here, you've already done one subtraction at the lower level, and then you'll do the second subtraction at the higher level. So the subtraction that you did at the lower level would have been happy faces minus sad faces. And so that difference is then passed up to the higher level where you do the subtraction between the normals and the schizophrenics. And those two combinations of subtractions will give you the interaction. So when you go to test at the higher level and you want to test interactions or something more complicated, uh, you just have to keep in mind the forest and the trees that you have these two different levels of, uh, of analysis and contrast at the first level and contrast at the second level. Um, let's see, then you do uh, the cluster-wise correction, and uh, again, this is the same thing as what John showed you, but with another twist. So I give it the, the G11 dir. I tell it to use pre-computed data that's uh, positive with a voxel forming threshold of 2, meaning P less than 0.01. Um, I tell it the, the cluster-wise threshold, so only report clusters that have a p-value of 0.05 or better. And then here is the uh, here's the, the twist in which before when you did the anatomical analysis, the thickness analysis, you would just specify two spaces, meaning just the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Now we have three spaces, which is left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and subcortical. And again, you get uh, these same outputs as before. You get uh, a cluster map, which is a map of uh, the values of, the, of all the clusters that are found. Uh, the OCN, which stands for output cluster number. So this is this um, this annotation that it creates. So when you click on the annotation, it tells you this is cluster number five. 
And then you get a, a summary file, which is um, a text file that has the size of the clusters, their XYZ coordinates, and their significances. And again, uh, this is correct, totally corrected for, for multiple comparisons across all the spaces. And this is what you would take and, and put into your, um, into your publication. Uh, so you would do this again for your left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and in an I-305. Um, for the subcortical analysis, it's basically the same, except there's a, a slight twist when you go to correct for multiple comparisons, and then you give it a dash dash GRF, which uh, tells it to use uh, the Gaussian random field approximation. Uh, but it's basically the same thing. It's uh, just a cluster-wise correction. Um, so, uh, so the only difference between what I did before uh, and this one is that you, that you did give it a, a Gaussian random fields uh, correction. And, uh, and again, three spaces. And again, it creates all of the same uh, cluster maps, uh, output, uh, cluster number, and cluster summary files. And then in the end, you get these three cluster summary files, and that's what you can put into your so in the full group analysis, you would have uh, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and M and I three or five. And it's actually so you would have maps, cluster maps for each one of those, and you can take those three, as I mentioned before, and recombine them into a volume, and you'll do that during the during the tutorial. So to summarize, um, you, have, you know it's a F as fast as a pipeline. You have certain uh, commands that you run in a certain order. Uh, you first analyze your data in FreeSurfer, make sure that it all looks uh, proper. Uh, you unpack your data using DCM unpack, which will create the directory structure for you, the FSFAST directory structure for you, or you can do it by hand, uh, in which case you have to create the directory structure yourself. You create the subject name file, which allows FSFAST to link to the anatomical analysis. Um, and then you copy these paradigm files in with the, the raw data. And these paradigm files are the stimulus schedule, which stimulus, which stimulus was presented when and for how long. You configure your analysis using MK analysis and MK contrast. And that, uh, that doesn't analyze any pixels. You can do it before you actually collect any data. Uh, all that does is to collect all of the parameters that you want to use to analyze your data together. So you know, it knows how many conditions you have, it knows what the paradigm file name is, it knows what preprocessing options you want to use. You then go off and analyze your data by starting with preproc-sesh, which does the motion correction, slice timing correction, uh, the zero distortion correction, the global rescaling uh, registration to um, the anatomical, um, what else? Um, and then you run selects out three dash sesh, and that goes off and does the first level analysis, fits the design matrix to the raw data, computes betas, computes contrasts, computes contrast variances. You then use, go to the higher level analysis where you run ISX concat dash sesh, and that takes that one number, so your contrast is just one number that is computed across um, um, all of your, for each subject. And so that at that point, it's like a thickness value. Um, so ISX concat takes that, that one map per subject and concatenate, concatenates them together uh, so as a preparation for the, the higher level general linear model, which is done with MRI GLM fit. And then you have uh, correction for multiple comparisons using MRI GLM fit sim. That gives you three tables one for the left hemisphere, one for the right hemisphere, and one for the And then I've been working on this last one, which is published as where you just give it the analysis and the name of the journal that you want. <laughs>